All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Uh, actually, we are in Hatch Auditorium. I have a group of people in front of us. Welcome to uh, Department of Medicine Grand Rounds and a special Grand Rounds, our Burson Yalo um, Grand Rounds during um, research um, time with our residents and so with our whole department. And just for yesterday, we had amazing amount of poster presentations with terrific work going on today. For those of you who were able to make it, just a reminder that from 10 to 12, we're having posters downstairs. They're going up now. At 11 will be uh, faculty walking rounds. And then at noon, we'll have the resident oral presentations. Uh, but now let's get started um, for our grand rounds. And I'll have Dr. Levin introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Research Day and Grand Round Research Day. The Bersaniello Memorial Lectureship is awarded to the physician, scientist, and researcher who embodies the extraordinary investigative spirit and selflessness of its namesakes, Dr. Solomon Burso and Dr. Rosalyn Yallo. Drs. Burson and Yallo helped develop a number of groundbreaking antigen assays for various hormones, including insulin, parathyroid hormone, ACTH, and growth hormones. Their work formed the foundation of modern nuclear medicine. And it should be noted that neither scientist patented these processes nor profited commercially from them. And Dr. Burson actually served as chair of the Department of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital. And in 1990, or 1977, I should say, Dr. Yallo received the Nobel Prize for their joint work, um, as it was after Dr. Burson's passing at that time. Today, we're joined by Dr. Roxana Moran as the recipient of our Burson Yallo Memorial Lectureship Award, which I will be able to show you in person today, not with a Zoom background. <laughs> So Dr. Moran is the endowed Mount Sinai professor in cardiovascular clinical research and outcomes, a professor of medicine and population health science and policy at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She's an internationally renowned interventional cardiologist and clinical research expert in the field of cardiovascular disease. She has built a globally respected academic research center focusing on developing randomized clinical trials and has served as principal investigator for numerous global studies, developed risk scores for bleeding and acute kidney injury, participates regularly in developing clinical guidelines, and has authored over 1,300 peer-reviewed articles. Dr. Moran is a current member of the American College of Cardiology Board of Trustees and has been included for six consecutive years as one of the world's most influential scientific minds and top 1% most cited researchers. It is truly our pleasure to be joined by Dr. Moran today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Levin. Thank you, Dr. Thomas and the entire Department of Medicine. It really is truly an honor for me to be here today. And I'm incredibly humbled to be the recipient of this um, named lectureship uh, for in, 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 in mem memory of two of the most outstanding clinician scientists uh, from here at this medical school. And also to have uh, Dr. Barry Kohler, who's one of my original mentors way back when, when I first started here at Mount Sinai as a fellow in cardiology and observed him coming into the emergency room while we were uh, caring for very, very difficult cardiogenic shock patients. And he'd be there in the middle of the night as the chief of medicine. So you really are truly an exemplary clinician scientist with your innovative work. So it really is humbling to be here today. Um, so um, first and foremost, my disclosures as the leader of the academic research organization here at the ICANN School of Medicine, we receive multiple grants from uh, pharmaceutical and device industries. So it's really important for you to, to note those. And I'm a frequent uh, speaker on WebMD and, and other programs. So it's important for you to note all of that, including the fact that my spouse is also recipient on some of these awards that I've put in there. Great. First and foremost, wow, it, are we post COVID? I hope so, <laughs> but so nice to be in this room and to have 
presence of some of you. And those of you on Zoom, I wish you were here live to see all of these uh, wonderful faces in the audience because interaction is so very important to keep us smiling. And I'm reminded of the incredible honor you're bestowing upon me on these two amazing scientists. Uh, and we already heard about Dr. Burson, um, true father of radio immunoassay, but most important, the founding chairman of the Department of Medicine here at Mount Sinai and the director of Mount Sinai Hospital from 1967 until his sudden death in 72. And then of his incredible wife, who I think is for sure the mother of endocrinology, the second woman, first American born woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine in 1977. So for all of us women who think we can't, yes, we can, it's possible. And uh, of course she, um, uh, rewarded her husband as well for developing this radio immunoassay techniques that we just heard about from Dr. Levin. And I think what's most important is that she has, she became, after joining here in the Department of Medicine as a research professor, she became the Solomon Burson Distinguished Professor at Large. And I think those are just incredible. And for me to be part of this, um, I'm hoping you're here in this room hearing us and smiling upon us. Okay, so let's turn into why I'm here. I'm here to say academic medicine is very much alive and that we absolutely, in order to improve human health, must have the basis of both research and clinical care teach the next generation so we can improve human health. Those are the pillars of academic medicine. And in this institution, it's alive and well. And I really believe that most of you in training should absolutely be thinking about building an academic career that will distinguish you from your peers. Why? Why should I do this? I'm busy enough. I already have so many epic charts to deal with, patients to see, et cetera. Well, these are the reasons. You advance medicine, you improve human health, and by doing research, you will have access to cutting edge technologies, whether it's in the basic lab, developing those, whether it's in translational, and it distinguishes you from your peers. So even if you wanna do primary care, private practice, it's time for you to enhance academic and research skills. It actually makes you a better physician in the future. So during your training years, those of you listening on Zoom, think about training in research. So who is that physician scientist? Well, they are either researchers with either an MD, MD, PhD, and they play an important role in bridging the gap between the bench to the bedside, combining both medical and scientific expertise. These physician scientists have tremendous potential to advance biomedical research, improve the translation of these new discoveries. And of course, then I keep coming back to it, improve human health. That's why we, are, we do what we do. The unique potential that physician scientists have, they ask the clinically relevant questions because they're clinicians in the research setting and they bring that rigorous scientific inquiry to the care of the patient. What, how much better could that get? So why, why again, why should I become a physician scientist? First of all, it will make you and completely um, enroll you in lifelong learning. There's incredible diverse activities in clinical research disciplines, intellectual independence and autonomy that you will gain as a physician scientist is compared to none. The public service that you will give to your patients, the mentorship that you will give to the next generation and the incredible societal need that we currently have. 
In fact, the New York Times had this very important article just before the pandemic. It's in everyone's benefit if physicians participate in research. And boy, did we learn that. No stronger reminder than in the COVID-19 pandemic where science came to life and helped improve and save lives. It was the clinician scientists who came together, collaborated, and made sure that we found answers to the unknown, something completely unknown in record time to save lives. We would not be here if it weren't for a clinician scientist coming together, collaborating, thinking outside of the box and solving the very, very difficult Pandora's box of COVID-19. But let me begin to tell you that clinical evidence generation has transformed over the years. I started out when it was very, very interesting, placebo controlled, some maybe confounded observational trials, a little bit about the product performance, et cetera, with a single hypothesis and a static answer. And we're still in that era of now comparative effectiveness, some consolidated randomized clinical trials that we absolutely have put as the gold standard. And now we're looking at some of the patient-centered and patient outcomes that are incredibly important. But where we're going in the future is very, very different and exciting. We're gonna be much more pragmatic. We have electronic health records that can inform us and get us real evidence in real time. The economic value becomes very, very important and the digital world is going to be very much incorporated, not just in extracting information, allowing us to get real evidence in real time for our patients. It is also very important to note that the wearables now become very much a part of the fabric of how we do research. And in fact, the future is just so bright in terms of never losing a patient or oh, lost to follow up because of the way we were connecting with our technologies. So this entire understanding of the healthcare system, this continuous update and the Bayesian learning has be, is gonna become where we go in the future. I believe it's very, very exciting. The medical research spectrum now is tremendous. So exciting. Basic science, preclinical research, linking with clinical and population health sciences, and then implementation science and research becomes incredibly important. What good is it if we develop something from the bench to the bedside, but we're not able to implement it to a population? What good is it if we actually study patients that are white males, and we have patients who are women, underrepresented minorities, and these things don't connect. But today, the spectrum becomes wider, much more exciting. And basic science research is how you can start this journey. And I'll tell you that's how I started, believe it or not, because the application and the applied science, the basic science is the roots of how we grow and become who we are. The work that Dr. Barry Kohler did in his laboratory back in Stony Brook saved lives in helping patients with acute coronary syndromes and SD segment elevation MI when he cloned the, the um, glycoprotein 2B3A receptor and its inhibition of that receptor that saved so many lives. Isn't it incredible? That legend is sitting right here in front of us. And it started in laboratories that he was leading and, and we applied that science to a population at large, and we now think differently about how we treat our patients with STEMI and non-STEMI. The translation of this work is how we're able to bring forth everything we learn in the lab to our patients. This is a circular, continuous, feedback mechanism. It doesn't stop when you go from the bench to the bedside because the bedside then teaches the bench to do other things, to innovate more. So it really is a feedback mechanism that continues to enhance human health. I'll keep saying human health. 
And clinical research is tremendous. We start in the discovery zone with preclinical trials, and we make sure that we've got it right before we go into that phase one first-in-man study. We shouldn't call it first-in-man. We should say first-in-human because there are women also, first-in-women. But then we move from phase one to phase two where we find, if it's in the pharmaceutical, we find a little bit about dose finding, what's best way in devices. We try to figure out the safety and efficacy in that phase one and phase two. And then we jump into the pivotal trials with phase three with lots and lots of patients. And then we go for approval. This is how we get devices and drugs approved through the system here in the United States. And I put it here, FDA, but in European or uh, Asian, it's obviously the regulators. As a physician scientist, you can be involved in all of those. And that's exciting. And you can be a part of solving the problem of helping human, uh, improve human health and saving lives. So how did I find my niche? It all started actually very much close and personal here at Mount Sinai. I don't know how many of you recognize some of these faces on here. Isn't Dr. Fuster look? <laughs> but, but before we get to Dr. Fuster, as an internal medicine resident, I spent a year in the basic scientific laboratories of Dr. Barbara Ehrlich. She's right here. On, uh, up there. She was working with the um, wonderful Dr. Arnold Katz, who, by the way, was chief of cardiology here at Mount Sinai all those years ago. This was at the University of Connecticut, where I did all of my residency. He was my first mentor. He pulled me out of the pact and said, you must spend time in the basic laboratory if you want to do research. And there I did single channel recordings of calcium channels on a lipid bilayer. And boy, it was tough. I didn't know anything I was doing, but I learned about the importance of basic sciences. It was a turning point for me. That's how I learned that translational research is so very important because I was able to link that to the calcium channels in the heart the ryanodine receptor, and the ability to understand heart failure and the issues around that, and especially some of the electrophysiological issues that would come in heart failure patients. I then spent another two years in the basic laboratory of Dr. Andrew Marks, who was here at Mount Sinai when I first arrived as a fellow. I was here during my fellowship and I had protected time afforded to me by my mentor, Dr. Fuster. And he did look like that back then. He was amazing. Then what did I do? After I finished my fellowship and trained as the first female interventional cardiology fellow at Mount Sinai, I was the first, believe it or not, my true passion for clinical investigation began to really hover inside of me. Stents were coming out, new devices. I was in the lab. I decided to go to where there was the best of the best, the most innovative work that was being done at the time at the Washington Hospital Center with my next mentor. Keep seeing the mentors. They keep coming. You don't just have one mentor. You will get plenty. Here I immersed myself in the opportunity of being in a very busy lab like the one we have here with amazing physicians who had love for innovation. And then it's easy because it was hard work, perseverance, curiosity for important questions, and following my passion to make a difference. It was really important to understand it's not easy, it's hard, and that's why it's fun. Because when you succeed, it really, really, you feel like you have really made an important difference. And here are some of the research highlights. Um, it was amazing in those early years. We were finding things no one had ever seen before because angioplasty and 
a PCI and intravascular ultrasound and stents were just brand new. And I was able to look at the patterns of instant restenosis and come up with these risk scores and thinking about bleeding and ischemic events and everything I touched was brand new. And I was able to actually explore some of these important issues. I also felt it was really important to lobby for patient reported outcomes. And so I worked very, very hard on that and to be inclusive and to make sure that our clinical trials are inclusive and not just enrolling white males. And so I embarked on this platinum diversity. I am most proud of this trial. I was a principal investigator of this study where we excluded white men because we just had so much data on new generation drug eluting stents in white males. So we ended up in record time enrolling women in underrepresented minorities. And now we're thinking, how else can we do this going forward? Because what good is the research if it can't be implemented in the population at large? And it's really, really important. Then through my work at the Academic Research Consortium publications, by just collaborating, the gift just kept on coming by collaborating with my peers to standardize some of the definitions in clinical trials. And I can't tell you the number of publications there where I believe the H index of 167 is due to these important consensus documents. And it really is this group. It's not one person. It has to do with collaboration across the academic groups around the globe that helped me get to where we are. But my curiosity about personalized medicine came to fruition in looking at some of these risk scores. In 2004, we came up with the Moran uh, uh, contrast-induced nephropathy risk score. I think it has over 5,000 citations, some crazy number. It's been embedded into multiple um, um, uh, epic um, so that people could see that, by the way, you're at risk for contrast-induced acute kidney injury. Well, just recently, we updated that, and it went to the Lancet. So we graduated from the Jack to the Lancet because of the reputation and the fact that people believed in my integrity and my commitment to the fields that I was studying. So another lesson to take away. The rewards are tremendous in research. You enrich your understanding of the value of specific therapies in general and even nuances. You improve your clinical insights. Evidence-based processes is really exciting. You sharpen your skills as a clinical practitioner. You know, uh, people call me, I, I, have, I think I have a 1-800 number now on how, what to do with dual antiplatelet therapies because of all the work that I have done, the different scenarios in clinical settings, what should I do, which, which, which one should I drop? And it really stimulates your intellectual and professional level in your work environment. And most importantly, it promotes clinical excellence, which is what we stand for right here at Mount Sinai. Importantly, as I said, you will have access to the newest therapies. You create an opportunity for global leadership and connection with collaboration. And you saw how we did that through the consensus documents we put together. And you satisfy your academic curiosity and, of course, foster meaningful contribution to clinical trial science and methodology. There are many clinical trials now that will consider our risk scores before they choose the population to study. And that to me is incredible because those risk scores, they weren't from any company, nobody, they didn't care. We wanted to answer questions that mattered to clinicians and a lot of those were unfunded. So we used funding from the funded projects to answer our academic curiosities that usually are not funded. And that was my way to be able to answer some of these important questions, keeping your integrity at large and at bay and very, very important. And I think you want to be a participant. I remember thinking, my goodness, you know, 
you go in to a STEMI, you open the blockage and you basically take someone out of their grave. It literally is the most gratifying thing that you ever do. I loved it as an interventional cardiologist. I realized that's why men love this. They just love it. It's great. It really makes you a very powerful person. But that was one life. In research, you can work to save millions of lives with your curiosity, with your good clinical trial um, methodology, and addressing the question in the right way and moving forward. But there are challenges. I've listed them. The most important one is time away from clinical work. I put that in like big, bold things. And of course, limited, dedicated time to research, the reimbursements, the fiscal issues, that horrible word, RVUs, when you get into clinical practice. How do you do that? But then most importantly, you could get into really big trouble if you just do research with a shorthand. Research requires dedication. So you don't want to have regulatory and compliance issues. So you need to have all of those ducks in a row and making sure you understand what it means and what kind of responsibility you're undertaking when you engage in clinical trials and in research. I take that very, very seriously. In fact, those are the most robust groups that I have put together in terms of oversight of regulatory compliance and safety for the patients that we study. The major challenge of funding, especially governmental, is tremendous. And we've seen that, how difficult it is. But there's good news because if you get on a training grant, if you actually are upfront about it, you could get there, especially if you're a first time researcher. The, any of you who are interested, please come to me and I will help you. I will help connect you because we have an entire population health group with a very, very good connection with the NIH and to get you on these training grants. But I want to go over some of the five key points to success and why I think it's really important. The first one is time management. And I, this is what I do every day. I have a day planner and I start with a list because if I don't have the list, I just can't. I put little boxes and I hope that I can check those boxes by the end of the day. I often don't. And I start my day early, one or two hours before clinical duties. And you have to set deadlines and meet those deadlines. Uh, and it's very, very important. And everyone in my team knows uh, that targeting uh, our abstract submissions and really, really going after our, our uh, presentations and then turning them into papers is very, very important and of utmost priority. All of us have the same hours of day. We can't stretch it. I've tried. It just, there are only 24 hours, but you need to be efficient and productive. And whatever that takes in your own style, think about it and move it in that direction. You have to find uninterrupted time, not just because you needed to like get through an abstract or a publication, but to think outside of the box, to answer questions that are unanswered. You need time to think about those. You know, Bill Gates goes away every whatever many, um, uh, every month or so, he takes a week where he goes and he thinks about what are the problems? And I think we all need some uninterrupted time. That is a very, very important one. And I always say, many come to me and they say, well, can I spend a couple of hours a week? And I always say, really, if you really want to do this, you need to train, you need to be here, you need to be part of us, you need to learn this. And to me, two months of Uninterrupted time is great. I took two years in the laboratory during my fellowship. And that work-life balance is ever so important now. I see both men and women. I hate that women were stigmatized for family life at home. We now see that there are great men coming in the next generation that also want to be home with their families. And that work-life balance is essential essential to keep, and of course, our mental health and our well-being, very, very important. Find a mentor. 
If you don't have one, if you're not getting advice, you're missing out. And you have every opportunity. It could even be a colleague. It doesn't have to be some chief who has no time for you. Do it early in your career, whether it's in your residency or fellowship. It helps you for the research path. And that a good role model for you could be that mentor, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Remember that mentorship is a give and take. It's a two-sided lane. It's not just about asking for things. It's also about giving. And that's really important that they are protecting you, advising you, motivating you. And it could be, I mean, I can tell you I have about 50 mentors, not one or two. I learn from my um, trainees they mentor me on certain things that I have no idea, especially with the current technologies. So there is no limit to the number of mentors you can have. The relationship can last a lifetime, and I can tell you that I have lifetime, for my lifetime, mentors. I can't underline the importance of your passion and interest. Work in an area that interests you. Don't force yourself to work on something because, oh, the opportunity is great. I'm going to write some papers, but I hate the topic. That just will never work for a lifetime change and a lifetime commitment for your career. Pursuing that topic and the passion that you have for that topic will drive you, will make you wake up early a couple of hours a day. It'll really, really, everything else kind of works out when you are excited about what you're doing. And engage yourself in one project that's easy, first, first off, and one project that's more challenging so that you could have understanding of success and failures. Remember, this is not a trajectory that goes like this. The slope could look like this, but there are ups and downs all throughout the years. I can't tell you the number of falls that I've had, really bad ones. And I just kept getting up. Be flexible, read, and stay focused. It has to be a way of your life. It has to be in your fabric. You have to think about it. Be open to criticisms. I have been criticized all the time. And I think with each criticism, I build myself to the next level and being better. Learn from your mistakes. And don't let rejections discourage you. I was just rejected just yesterday on some position that I was looking at. It happens and it's good because now I'll go into the next one with a, with a new way forward. You can never stop learning. Read, 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 write, 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 and then read some more and write some more. That is the way you will go forward. That first paper is the hardest one. The next one gets a little bit easier. And then all of a sudden, it just comes out of your fingers like the pen just moves across the, the it's incredible how it works once you get it going. Set your goals and then reassess and evaluate yourself at the end of each year. Maybe it could be every six months, etc. I can't underline the importance of cooperation and collaboration. I believe my success and the fact that I have now um, connections around the world is because of the collaborate, collaborative uh, way that I proceed it with research. No task in research can be accomplished without collaboration. And I think it's so important to reach out in other institutions, other parts of the world, and understand the cultural, if we're going to make an impact on the global burden of cardiovascular disease, for example, which is what I care about, we have to collaborate with our colleagues across the globe. And if I had advice to my younger self, I wish that I had this now, like back then, um, you can do it. I kept saying that to myself, but I would be like, so, oh no, this is impossible. I want to be a mother. I want to have children. This will never happen. I'll have to be like, and I, I'm married with three children, as you all might know. Um, read, ask questions, know your strengths and weaknesses. It will be difficult at times, 
especially early on, but it gets better. And the way you make it better is if I wish someone could tell me that, that in stress, there are sweet spots. And if you look for them, you will find them. And take advice, but think independently. Your, your mentor will say things to you that may or may not make sense, but you have to think independently and maybe you will fail from that, but you will learn. You will learn from your failures. And time is the most important asset. Don't waste your time. So can you do be a clinician and a researcher at the same time? I think it definitely is. Take a look what we have at Mount Sinai. Absolutely, and they're all here. Some of them are right here in this room. So it's absolutely possible. My research work, and I wanna introduce you to our Center for Interventional Cardiovascular Research and Clinical Trials. We are running academics, biometrics, research operations. We work very, very closely with our own cath lab. We have a lot of interests in antiplatelet therapies, contrast-induced acute kidney injury, TAVR and antithrombotic regimens, risk stratification, and very importantly now on cardiovascular disease in women. We've done several landmark studies with major, major, major publications that are listed here. And I really have to tell you that I'm most proud of this Mount Sinai PCI database that Dr. Sharma put together, and we now have made it completely digital. No one extracts, no human extracts data. There is no human error. We programmed everything from Epic to feed into this database, and we have long-term follow-up, so we are ahead of the game. We were able to do this by answering questions that mattered and publications like this one. And you'll see today, um, Franz will present uh, the Twilight Cabbage sub-study. This particular trial is already given us, changed the guidelines, the guidelines, the US guidelines and the European guidelines. What better satisfaction can you have to do, answer a simple question of dropping aspirin with the dual antiplatelet therapies in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial? than to actually make a difference in how clinicians then treat patients because we will save bleeding without ischemic complications. And we showed that and it changed the guidelines. We have a 2A recommendation should be considered. And with the help of our collaboration across the globe and um, faculty here at Mount Sinai, Dr. Dangus and colleagues were able to answer questions on antithrombotic therapies after TAVR. And we still don't have it right. And we were able to answer those questions with New England Journal publications. We're very, very proud. We're small academic research organization, but we make big impact. It's exciting. And we just published this in The Lancet, this contemporary new risk score and of course, I was given the honor of leading a commission for the Lancet to reduce the global burden of cardiovascular disease in women. My goodness, I just was like, really me? I was having imposter syndrome. Why me? Well, yes, because of everything I just showed you. Because I'll get it done and I'll make sure that it's out there. And we showed this with senior commissioners and commissioners across the globe, and we were able to deliver that. We have amazing research scholars from all over the world. And Johnny Nicholas is joining you guys. How exciting. And he's here with us. He's been one of the most prolific uh, research uh, fellows that I've had. He's an incoming internal medicine residence. And what a great opportunity for internal medicine residents to come through our organization and to have the ability to publish, to learn research methodology, not publish just in small throwaway journals. Franz has a nature medicine. It's like just next to the Lancet and many, many more. And we have some of the most incredible, incredible, brilliant, brilliant internal medicine residents. How lucky are we here at Mount Sinai with such brilliant minds? And I'm so glad that you're exposing yourselves to the next level. And our cardiology fellows now are finding their way, coming through and working with us. And many of them were residents here with you all. 
So please think about research as a way to build your career to the next level, to improve human health, and please reach out to me, those of you on Zoom who are not here, anyone who wants, who's interested to learn and to work with us, our doors are open and we would embrace you. Final thoughts, research is incredibly rewarding if you are committed and enthusiastic. I haven't stopped my enthusiasm. I can't wait for the next trial I'm designing. And remember one thing, I love these two quotes. Strive not to be of success, but of value. That's from Albert Einstein. And then I think the woman who's taught me so much, reading all of her amazing work, she says, Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. And that's what we need to do in our research, in our clinical care for our patients, in our inclusivity and diversity to improve human health. And we we'll can do it as physician, clinician, scientists. I hope you will join us. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. We really appreciate that. It was a great talk for us. Thank you. So do we have any questions from the audience? I hope there are tons of questions. We're going to get into Zoom and, and uh, we're working on it now. So yeah, that's good. Any questions from anyone? So yes. How did you learn about you know, like trial design? Like that takes a lot of Very good question. I, I wish I had more time. Uh, I learned it on the, on the street. But I would say, I would say, if you're interested, train in clinical trial methodology. And Mount Sinai, right here, there's a fantastic program for Masters of Public Health and Masters of Biostatistics. You learn research methodology. The time is afforded to you. Johnny just is, will be graduating. He, he took on the advice to train because when you train and you have those credentials, when you speak, people in the room will listen to you. I often saw that the people who had their, uh, you know, MPH or Masters of Biostatistics, even though they weren't really saying anything that was that much more amazing, they were listened to more so than me who didn't have that. So I would say, and it was hard to learn it, um, you know, by doing, I think it's really important to train and then, um, uh, and train early so that you could start thinking like a clinical trialist. It really will help you. Any other questions? Anyone, please feel free. No questions online? Okay. Please add your comments or questions online. Yes, and anybody who wants to find time, I've left my, you know, uh, my email, and uh, our our um, center is open to take on any of you who want to engage and research. Some of you have already called and will be coming in, so I'm really excited. So. I wonder, Dr. Moran, if you could comment a little bit on you. You talked about the ups and downs. And I yes. Think that's, that's really critical, people. You have an amazing career, absolutely magnificent career yeah. right now as you stand here in front of everybody. Yeah. But you went through all that. And as you integrated yeah. your work life balance and things like that, I wonder if you could just sort of. Talk yeah, about that. I, I think it's really important that the journey is what matters, and we hear that a lot. And the journey is not always about successes one after the other. I, I would say that I was very lucky. I had mentors like Valentin Fuster, Dick Gorlin, Arnie Katz, uh, Marty Leon, Barry Kohler. I really was very, very lucky. I was immersed in those. But I also had so many failures, so many, so many difficult times. And each time I felt that with all of those, I would learn something and do it differently and do it better the next time. And it's very similar to saying that do what you can to, to know better. And when you know better, do better. And I think it's really, really important to take on the failures and embrace them in a way to move forward uh, and learn from them. And I really believe, and, and many will tell you that uh, the journey is, has a lot of ups and downs. 
And that fear of missing out when you're, you know, pregnant and going out on your maternity leave or whatever it is, I, I hardly had any maternity leave, but I would say, please take your maternity leave because then you look back and you say, oh my God, what did I do? Um, it's really, really important, the fear of missing out to push that aside and to really embrace your daily um, journey and your daily activities in a way that how you could learn and grow from it. Um, I also would say the biggest thing I think in research is to keep your integrity intact. It's incredibly important to be absolutely honest. And sometimes in my honesty, I have lost people who would want to fund my projects because they wouldn't like that I would speak the truth and I would be very open. I'm not endorsing, um, you know, false truths. I would never do that. And so what was great about the work that I have done is that everything can repeat itself and every one of these risk scores, because when you're honest in your work and when others repeat your work, they will find the same results. So our risk score that came out of this database is now being applied and people are calling me that it's just amazing. I said, well, yeah, it's easy. If you're honest and you just, you don't want to get a result that looks good this first time and, you know, fudging the result to make it look good. That's a very, very short lived win. A true win is to come out when your trial is negative and be open about it and then design the next one and see how you could do better. Because then people will believe in you and work and understand what you're doing is absolutely correct. Pretty much everything that I have done has been replicated with exactly the same results. And that makes me feel so good that people don't refute what, what we do and what we have published in the past. And I think that part of it is really, really enlightening for me. Because at the end of the day, we all have to sleep well at night. So honest, keep honest, don't do shortcuts. Don't be, don't be misled by the great ways of maybe winning one small thing by not being completely honest. You have to be 100% honest in your research and in your work and completely dedicated. And I think that's one of the big advice that I give to everyone because your integrity you build for a lifetime and you can lose in a second. Always remember that. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Hi, Roxana. This is uh, Isaac Sachmechi. I'm chief of endocrinology at the Queen's Hospital Center. We are affiliated to Sinai. I wanted to tell you that there is some disparities also in research. You know, it depends which location really you are to get the support of the administration really in research. You know, I started this maybe 15 years ago, uh, having clinical research in Diabetes Center of Excellence. I didn't get much help from the institution. I had to bring grants uh, to get in touch with pharmaceutical companies for phase three and phase four studies and work very hard and extra times of my time that I can get zero from me, to build up a very good diabetes center of excellence that has also clinical research. So if the uh, affiliates really get the support of Sinai in, in that term, that would be very helpful with, with, uh, for affiliated uh, institution to Mount Sinai really to advance that. I have one clinical research uh, coordinator that I bring her salary from these grants and I'm trying to get help because I'm running now seven or eight studies currently, and the administration not helping me at all in getting really research assistance. I, I think your question is about the importance of institutional support in enhancing and improving and, and building a research career. I mean, I think, you know, um, yes, uh, obviously it's great to have tremendous institutional support, but you can understand that um, Institutional support usually is connected to government NIH funding where the, the institution does get support from the NIH to support you. 
And I think it is difficult when you're doing industry work to get the kind of institutional support that you absolutely need. And I've often struggled with that as well, but I have overcome those struggles by just working harder and, and building uh, important um, teams and being able to um, continue. I agree if you have institutional support for the work that you're doing that's meaningful um, and especially um, protected time, all of those things are difficult to gain for everybody because someone has to take care of the patients and the bills and the lights have to be paid and all of those things. So I, I agree, it's a big, big challenge. And I'm sure that the new chief of medicine who's coming here will be, um, will be dealing with some of those important challenges. Um, but, but I also think that there is a fine line between how much your institution can support you and also what are you doing to make sure you could support your research, your protected time that then uh, allows you to have uh, that. It's very, very difficult. I, I agree. And it's a very, very good question. It's a dilemma that we will all be facing if we're not given that kind of support. Uh, especially to the talented uh, physicians who are committed to this. So thank you for your question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the question is, what's the value of, of it? Yeah. About, um, going elsewhere for different places. Yeah. So really, really good question. Is it good to kind of leave and come back and that kind of thing? Well, I did. I left. Uh, I, um, it was hard to leave, you know, but you leave Mount Sinai, but it never leaves you. Look, Dr. Kohler is back here. Uh, so it never leaves you. You kind of come back because it feels like home. I think, uh, you know, it's the Mount, right? And, and so you come back. Uh, you come back, but uh, and we all come back and we are all connected to this institution. It's such an incredible institution and we have such great bond. And isn't that great? But it also is good to leave and to learn um, from other perspectives. And I felt that at that time, for me, it was best to go where the innovative scientific work was being done in terms of the subspecialty that I was interested in. And um, I remember it was very, very difficult to leave, uh, but I did it and it was, it was a good choice for me. So it's not always like that, but it always is nice to go and see other institutions. And in leaving, I got to, because I followed my mentor, I got to be in four different institutions. So we started at the Washington Hospital Center, then Lenox Hill, then Columbia. So I got to see how these institutions also run uh, with clinical studies as well as clinical care. And I gained tremendous insights because it's so very different. And then I was recruited back here, back home to Mount Sinai. So to me, I feel that I have um, a great depth and breadth of understanding different institutions, different academic arenas. And I think it's a good thing. It's a great question. We have one more. One more question. Oh, great. What are the critical steps of translating basic science research into, um, into clinical trials to patients? So that is really a very, very important. I believe that those are the most fertile grounds that unfortunately we haven't been cultivating. We need to cultivate translational research in a way that is unparalleled in this institution, just like others are doing. Like we see it at Stanford, we see it at other institutions, and we're doing that here too, especially in different arenas. Translating the, the what's going on at the bench, bringing it to the bedside takes a village. It means that you have to have those important collaborations and understanding and meeting together. So you exchange ideas and you feed it back and forth to each other and then designing and understanding if something is going on at the bedside. And I can show you what, what happened right here in this institution. When rapamycin, uh, which is the, the drug that is used on the coated stents, it was developed right here in this lab when we were injecting it in pigs up here 
in Annenberg 24 or 21, whatever it was, where I was uh, working with Juan Batamon and his team. And there was a, a, a gentleman here from Canada, Richard Gallo. He was doing this work. I think you were here, Dr. Kohler, as the chief of medicine. And we were seeing like, oh my God, there's no restenosis when these, in these injury models. And, and of course we missed the step there in that when it went to get coded on the stent, we, we, didn't, we didn't connect the dots. But then when I was over at um, the Washington Hospital Center and they were just starting to think about stents had come in, they were saying, do you know about that study that was done at Mount Sinai with rapamycin? We're thinking about coding that you know, on the stent. And my goodness, and by the way, the mechanism of the rapamycin, the basic mechanism was discovered right here at Mount Sinai right here in Andy Marks's lab with Steve Marks, who basically um, uh, showed the mechanism by which rapamycin was working and all of these important other drugs similar. And that's where we are today. That is the perfect example of how translating from basic science to clinical science could make an incredible difference. And that's what exactly happened from the pig model to the basic laboratory where the mechanism was unveiled to human use and now proliferation of drug eluting stents for all and reducing morbidity mortality, especially in the patients presenting with an acute myocardial infarction. So there is no better way to show translational work at large, improving human health. And it's through collaboration and talking across each other and making sure we bring it forth. So very, very good question, thank you. Sure. Thank you so much for this. And I think one of the uh, inspirational uh, aspects of your, your presentation is how much of an impact you had directly on our residents and fellows here. So I wonder if you have some advice for, for faculty in terms of training residents and fellows and, and what types of projects and uh, how do you yeah. set them up for success and inspire them? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most uh, amazing things that I've had is my uh, having internal medicine residents in, in, our, in our lab. We have like a beehive down there, you know, they just sit there and they're just having so much fun and they're talking to each other, exchanging, creating that kind of an exciting environment where everyone is working on the same thing and they're all working on their presentations. They get to go and present the brilliant minds of the next generation. And what we have here in this institution is tremendous. And I would say to every faculty, every time you miss talking to these residents and exploring what their interests are is a miss happening for you, a missed opportunity for you as an attending. And so I think, you know, I'm just amazed of the talent that you've been able to bring here in this residency program. These are some of the smartest, amazing physicians who are gonna be caring for our patients. And, we should cultivate that incredible, those, their incredible brains and give them opportunities to grow and spend time with them and let them communicate with each other and feel like there's a community of researchers. Come to my, come to my center, I'm in the basement. It's, it's pretty dull and ugly down there, but we have so much fun at like six, seven o'clock at night, it's like, a, it's like Grand Central Station down there. They're all having fun, exchanging ideas, writing their protocols. I haven't been more inspired than, than, than that. And that is through, through the program. So thank you for giving them the opportunity to work with me. And I do agree that we have the most amazing residents. You and do. <laughs> I invite you all to come today to poster session to see all the That's amazing right. work that they do. Excellent. And then to our, uh, noon session. And so with that, I want to thank everyone for coming. Really thank Dr. Moran for thank showing you. us.